if you can have a supportive environment that's not a crazy echo chamber and is you're keeping fairly level-headed and making good trade-offs, that will put you in good stead to deal with any type of situation, right? Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the behaviour-based UX research partner for enterprise leaders who need an independent perspective to align hearts and minds, and also the home of New Zealand's first and only world-class human-centred research and innovation lab. You can find out more about what we do at thespaceinbetween.co.nz. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to keep on top of the latest thinking and important issues affecting the fields of UX research, product management and design. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings and expert advice of a diverse range of world-class leaders in those fields. My guest today is Ash Ivory. Ash is the head of product at Askable, a global participant recruitment and research platform that empowers organizations to make better product decisions. In their role as head of product, Ash leads the product vision as well as the people responsible for delivering on that vision, including product managers, designers, engineers, and researchers. Before joining Askable, Ash was the head of product at Outfit, an automation platform for large-scale brand management and production, and which was recently acquired by Smartsheet for an undisclosed sum. When Ash is not enabling great product to be built, they can be found coaching others in the office in the art of brewing great coffee or riding their motorcycle in an act of active meditation. More on that soon. A regular voice in the product community, Ash has been a guest speaker at Product Tanks and was recently featured on the New E Tech People podcast. And now they're here with me for this conversation on Brave UX. Ash, hello, and a very warm welcome to the show. Hey, Brennan. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. It was wonderful seeing you all the way back in February. Who would have thought this year at UXNZ? Really enjoyed catching up and meeting you in person. And since then, I've had the, I'd, I'd say it was the pleasure of learning a little bit more about you, listening to some things that you've said before, that things that you've been uh, written up on in the in the press. And one of my sources tells me that there might be a bit of a cross-stitching competition going on in your home between you and your <laughs> wife. Is this true? Look, if it was a competition, Brendan, I'm definitely losing. But uh, I do I do love to cross-stitch. My first cross-stitch was a little uh, Golden Girls cross-stitch and it said, thank you for being a friend, which was a bit cute. Oh, that's and really cute. Yeah. It was really cute. And my wife jumped in on the hobby and has since just absolutely dominated me uh, completely. So if it's a competition, I'm very much losing. Well, it's uh, it's good of you to admit that. It's really good of you to admit that. That's brave. That's brave. We're on to our first brave start for the, for the show. <laughs> You mentioned the Golden Girls, and I understand that TV characters and movie characters are a bit of a, a thing for you in the whole cross-stitching um, world that you've been entering here. What is the last little pixel person that you've made? Oh, goodness. Now you are asking me. The last one would have been a Harry Potter, a little Harry Potter sort of character feature. So onto Hermione. And the one I did before that was a little Mean Girls one as well, which is all a bit cute. I love it. I love it. I wish I had some skills with needle and thread, but I, I do not. I'm more of a keyboard warrior, I must say. I want to talk to you about something else that I understand, which is kind of craft-based that you're into. In fact, there's probably more than I know about, so feel free to fill me in here. But this is in particular about customizing motorbikes. And that to me, when I was watching some videos of you talking about this in the past, it's it's like a very exotic, in my mind, it's like a very exotic uh, scene or community to be part of. How did you get involved in this? Oh, goodness. That's a, a very big question. So we, we might have to rewind uh, <laughs> quite a way back to uh, where I was born, actually. Uh, so Let's do it. My, my dad always into quite extreme activities. So uh, he was a skydiver for many years um, of my my childhood as well. He was a tandem master. And yeah, we even re relocated for one of his jobs for a while. But he also really loved motorbikes. I very much remember him having a, a little camper trailer that he could sort of strap to the back of 
his um, K100 as well and, and go and do some jumps on the weekend. So all these wild hobbies sort of combining, but I grew up on the back of that bike and loved it, got very comfortable very quickly. So one of the stories my mum used to tell me about, you know, me being on the back of the bike is that I'd sort of hang on to dad and a couple of minutes into the journey, I'd be asleep and he'd sort of have to hang on to me as (laughs) as we would be riding home. But yeah, started sort of on the back of dad's bike and then a little bit later on grew up on sort of properties and uh, a lot of my friends had large banana farms and things like that. So always riding, you know, little peewee 50s and bits and pieces around and just loved it, loved getting my hands dirty uh, and was a bit of a, a bush kid growing up really. And fast forward many, many years, my mom actually fell sick with cancer, which was a bit of a shock. And after she passed away, Getting on the bike with dad again was a really special moment and it kind of allowed us to connect without having to discuss too much. And, you know, at that time I was, I was quite young. I was only 18 and, you know, we were, we were still very different people. I think dad and I, and over such a a big event like that, getting on the bike and sort of riding together. And so obviously on separate bikes as as I was a little bit older, but getting on the bike and riding together was incredibly cathartic. And I think it helped him a lot, but it also opened up a completely different world for me. Again, sort of that hobby dropped away a little bit. I didn't have a bike with me when I, I moved to Brizzy. And so I went through quite a large breakup and decided, all right, now it's time to do a few things that I've I've really wanted to carry through in life. So bought a brand new little TU250X. So for anyone that's into motorbikes, you'll know that that's a, a lovely little bike to learn to ride on. It's also super easy to customize and, and starting, you know, you can start to dream up different ways to kind of strip it back and make it your own. And yeah, that was the bike that kind of took me into that whole world of customization and this incredible community of people that really don't care what you ride or, you know, what you do outside of um, motorbikes. They just want to talk about riding and they want to know why you ride and they really just want to wrangle you into a ride so they can have more riding partners as well. So, yeah, it is, it's an incredible community and it's sort of, I guess, weaved in and out of my life and it's very much a, a part of my daily routine now as well. Is it still something that you share in common and that brings you closer to your dad? Absolutely, yes. So one of the the bigger commitments I guess I've got in motorcycling is I'm the host of the Brisbane Distinguished Gentleman's Ride and this year was my, uh, would have been my third year hosting on my own. We have over 600 bikes that join us for the day and, you know, it's a bit of a logistical nightmare but It's absolutely a labor of love getting 600, you know, very uh, loud, sometimes uh, unreliable bikes through the heart of Brisbane City. And this year, Dad was able to come down and we shared, yeah, it was a a pretty incredible moment, I think, for both of us to, to one, be together on that day, be able to ride together and also reflect on sort of where our journey started and where the connection really formed over bikes as well. Yeah, you mentioned when you were describing in the wake of your mum passing that the bike brought you closer together without having to say much, I believe is what you what you said there or thereabouts. Has, since the passage of time has passed and with this event that you just described, uh, this year was it or was it last year? Yeah, this this year um, this doing year. the DGR together, yeah. Yeah, is, is that something that you were able to open up and have more direct conversation with your dad about life and about the things that have gone on in the interim? Yeah, absolutely. I think life ebbs and flows in terms of, you know, how much you're opening up and to who. And I think as I've become, you know, more of my own person and, become more of a, I guess, a little bit of a different person to dad. I I think I was absolutely, you know, a chip off the old block, so to speak, when when I was younger with dad. And we tended to kind of 
we were always at odds, I think, because we were so similar. But I think as I've grown up and he has observed me in many different, you know, situations and, and whether that's from, you know, being on the bike and, and now seeing me as a confident rider or seeing, you know, the career I've chosen or or how I continue to, you know, deal with different things. I think the bike has just been a bit of a way to start to open those conversations up. But we certainly don't rely on bikes anymore, which is which is quite nice. Yeah, it sounds like it's been one of those positive experiences and something that's been a long a long staying part of your relationship and I understand that your dad I'm not sure when this was but I was listening to an interview that you gave about DGR on the Mm -hmm. Bendix Moto's video series The Ride and you mentioned a piece of advice there that your dad gave you about riding Mm -hmm. a bike what was that piece of advice that's always stuck with you well he's he's given me a few over the years but the main one is that you shouldn't trust indicators. And I think that is a really beautiful metaphor for, I guess, people's intentions and not in a pessimistic way, but I think you have to really understand where people are coming from and where they're trying to get to regardless of what they're signaling. And the one thing that dad always said is, you know, don't look at the indicator, look at the wheels. The wheels tell you where they're going. And I think there's there's a lot to unpack there if if we really wanted to digress into a a whole other you know topic but yeah i think it is a beautiful me- metaphor of you know knowing someone's intentions or or truly where they want to go that helps me a lot as a leader today but yeah it was a brilliant piece of advice you can't really take responsibility for other people on the road but you can take responsibility for yourself and your own perceptions and you know your own choices and so that has stuck with me and um touch wood i still haven't had any major accidents so hopefully that attitude you know of kind of that extreme responsibility you know carries me through well yeah, it's a very, listening to you frame that, it's a very stoic type framing of what you can and can't control, particularly on the bike. But I'd be keen to explore the career implications this this, uh, this saying may have had for you as well. But quite literally coming back to riding the bike on the road, is this piece of advice something that has saved your life? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Numerous times. I think not just indicators, but understanding where people's minds are and even pattern recognition. I think it's something that serves us quite well and can be at times also a bit limiting. So you've you've really got to be aware of, you know, how quickly your mind's working. But on the bike, it's absolutely one of those things that I think can make the difference between, you know, getting cleaned up by a car and, and just, you know, casually changing lanes and knowing that there's a way around the situation. So Yes, you are right, B. It's absolutely saved my life and I think it will continue to in years to come in different rides. Oh, we'll move on from motorbikes soon, but I did want to <laughs> ask you about one other thing uh, to do with riding that you've said, and I'll quote you now. You've said, I've always, I guess, been known for being pretty particular with things, whether it's clothing or anything that I'm looking at. I really like to understand where it's coming from and why it exists. So the parts on the bike are pretty much the same. What's your earliest memory of being particular about something? Oh my goodness, that is an incredible question. When I was younger, my mum used to take me to material shops so she was a um she was a sewer um seamstress if you want to be fancy but she made everything and one of my sort of little rewards if I was good in the shop was I got to choose a a type of pattern t-shirt material and she would make me a shirt and I always remember it taking the longest So she would give me a bit of a heads up and I'm sure it was a, you know, absolutely a reward strategy as well. But sometimes (laughs) choosing the pattern, you know, that I wanted would take longer than, you know, mum going through and and getting all of her pieces for whatever she was creating. So that's a very early memory of being very particular about certain things. But, you know, there's, there's, other examples as well. But yes, that one sticks with me. I can still kind of remember 
I, I had this shirt I just adored and it was black. It had some, you know, crazy sort of neon art on it. Very, very 90s and perfect for the time. And I wore that shirt so much. I think it, it faded to white that sort of the black print faded to white and I just adored it. I'm not sure if we ever had any um, additional material, but I loved it so much because I was just so stoked with the pattern. Mm, maybe you can track down the pattern and have another one made because the 90s fashion is certainly, is certainly back, at We're least back, on the streets Fee. of Auckland. Yeah, I know, it, it's the same. I have a 16-year-old a daughter and the things that she's wearing now, I, I'm kind of kicking myself that I didn't, you know, hoard a bunch of things from my teenage years because they would have been perfect. Hey, you talked there about your mum being a sewer or a, or a seamstress. Yeah. And patterns and the art of making clothes. And maybe this is my own projection here, uh. but it strikes me that in order to do that well, you need to be quite particular as well about the details. Absolutely. I Observing mum growing up was quite interesting because I think there were many things in her life that she absolutely had, you know, very, very organized and, and to a T. And then there were other things that were just wildly messy or, you know, out of control. And, and I think we all have things like that in life, but when it came to mum's process of, you know, planning a pattern I just absolutely adored sitting I I kind of had this we had this high bench near her dressmaking sort of area and I would sit there for hours and watch her pin patterns and watch her cut lines and I just I loved watching the process and she was so gifted it's a shame that she wasn't able to I guess, be around people that could sort of bring more of that talent out. But she could make everything from, you know, formal gowns, wedding gowns, all the way through to like patching parachutes when dad was, you know, skydiving and also making jumpsuits. She was so versatile, but I think her her real passion laid in you know, couture and it's a little bit of a shame that she didn't get to explore that, you know, as as far as I think she could have taken it. But yeah, absolutely just obsessive about her process and the way she put things together. I think I grew to appreciate um, what it means to have a ritual and she was very ritualistic as well. You know, she would get up at the same time every day. She had time in the morning on her own and and kind of, you know, really structured her day that way. So I loved that side of her. And I think I probably picked up a lot of um, my obsessions from that as well. And these obsessions, particularly around attention to detail, they have a darker side or they can have a darker expression to them. And I wanted to pick up on something that you've talked about openly before, which is a period in your career a few years ago where uh, perhaps your tendency to push yourself and perhaps be a little self-critical took you to a place that you didn't expect. And I just want to give people some context here because this is quite a common, or at least to me, it feels like a common uh, situation for people who work in tech to find themselves in, particularly if they're wired in a similar way to you, Ash. Mm. And, you know, this is a an industry that can reward, uh, very much reward that type of grinding type behavior, particularly when it comes to achieving a goal at work. And you've previously said about about your childhood, actually, so sort of tying this back to your conversation there about your mum, but maybe a little bit older here. You said, I remember as a kid, I used to play soccer at quite a competitive level. And I'd sort of come off the field and my coach would say to me, oh, you did this great, Ash, and that was a good pass and you defended well there. And I had a list of things that I knew I did wrong. So how much, if, if any at all, did your descent into burnout when you were working at Outfit, mm. how much of that was related to this self-critical narrative or to this being particular on the details? It's a good question because I think it's quite layered. I'm not sure if initially it came down to yeah, I think initially it wasn't through a self-critical lens. I was excited to be learning new skills and my journey at Outfit, you know, absolutely started at a point where I was in front of customers and just working it out, you know, meeting by meeting. And that took me through to 
head of product, which at the time I didn't really understand my career trajectory. I was just tackling, you know, the next challenge in front of me that needed tackling for the company. But looking back now, I can understand how rapid, you know, that that kind of journey was. And I think that is probably the other part of my nature that can uh, allow me to overload myself a little bit too much. But you're right, the obsessive nature to want to know all the details, like you were, you know, sort of talking about with the motorcycle parts and all of those things start to converge. And I think as I've reflected on outfit uh, and where I am now today, it, it's really important for me to keep things in balance and to keep a check on my energy levels, myself, my feelings. I can kind of put those to the side a little bit. And I think that's where that that critic comes out of being a, a little bit more driven, you know, or or observant than the average person. And therefore you kind of start to get ahead of, you know, other people around you. So that example of me coming off the field, that's, you know, that happened every game. And um, my coach really, it, you know, it, it actually caused, I think, some concern for him later on that he could never quite get me, you know, in a positive mind that if I was really fixated on something that I'd messed up. So over the years, I've learned to try and let go of those things that I can't change. My mum, though we weren't overly re religious, there were, you know, a few really important, I guess, morals for us as a family. And one of them was that serenity prayer that, you know, is 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 quite common and obviously changing the things that you you can change and accepting the things that you can't. So I remember we used to have a, a little magnet on the fridge that had it on there along with a, a couple of other quite funny ones as well. But I think knowing how intense it can get when you, you know, let yourself sort of hang on to things in the past, I've learned to take that obsession and try and turn it into a way to, you know, do things differently or experiment or push myself forward, but also understand where I am in terms of energy, uh, motivation, you know, and also other people around me, because I think I have the tendency to be a little bit overwhelming if I'm extremely excited or if, if I'm really kind of, you know, really driven down a certain path, it can be overwhelming for others. So trying to take all those things into consideration now and, and have a little bit more of a, a pulse on how I'm feeling, whether I'm taking things a little bit too seriously or a little bit too far. Yeah, it's 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 definitely still there. I'm just trying to harness it in the right ways now. Mm -hmm. You you previously, when you've talked about this, you indicated that you weren't really aware that you were burning out at the time. What was it that eventually awakened to you to what was actually happening? I'm generally the type of person that if I'm in, I'm in, like I'm all the way in. And so I at times take that as, you know, a, a, a quite extreme commitment. And I think I have that ability to kind of block out, you know, some of the, the struggles or, or the pain or, you know, you sort of want to push through, I guess, that mental barrier. And I think if you talk to anyone who's had sport in their life and, and that values sport or, you know, team or, or like you sort of touched on it being at any level that's competitive, I think there's a natural tendency to work at that override because there is that, you know yourself that sometimes it's a, it's a battle of will or your mindset and you can push your body a little bit further and and if you're in a a final and it's down to a few minutes and you've really got to you know put it in it can be the difference between you know coming out on top and and not feeling like you did your best and so i think perhaps there was a point where i realized i was overriding every single sane voice in in my head you know as well as people around me for the wrong reasons as well i think that's a bit of a critical thing to define with burnout is that Yes, there's times in life where you have to push and there's times where you, you need to take that break. 
but if you're pushing for the wrong reasons and it's it's not adding up i think that's where you kind of get the sense of hang on this doesn't feel like i'm you know i don't feel like i'm having any you know reward or or any real trade off for the energy it just feels like a, a bit of a bottomless pit that i i can't really you know see the end of so to me that was the moment where things started to feel quite overwhelming i i really couldn't get out of bed and i was struggling to have conversations that would normally be a breeze and I, and i wasn't caring about things that i normally would and and going back to some of your earlier points you kind of know when you're a bit of a you know an obsessive person and someone who loves detail and you pride yourself on those things when they start to slip then i think you know something's something's off kilter yeah 100% 100% the um listening to you describe this the other part of the story that i felt was really important for people to hear particularly if they are this way inclined or maybe they're starting to feel like they might be heading this way is not just the surprise that you felt when you realized that you were burned out you've also said that you were surprised and I'll paraphrase you here just how long it took for you to uh, to reset to recover confidence and and being a leader and to sort of get back up on your feet so I was curious about this just how long did it take to get back to that space where you were energized and excited about things and how did you get back to that place i would say it took me a good 8 months if not a year to really really feel like i was myself again i had confidence in myself and just the processes or, or ways of thinking that came quite naturally to me before that, you know, I, I felt a lot of hesitation around. And so it was when I had my first annual review at, at Askable, I was sort of reflecting on this with um, my CEO, John, and I remember saying to him, I did not realize how long it was going to take, you know, me to kind of show up again the way that I, I wanted to. I think the way that I knew is that I was just excited about product work again. And I was enjoying whiteboarding and I wasn't, I I didn't sort of have that sense of dread, you know, when we would get in a room and discuss priorities. So I think paying attention to things that were triggering in the past as well and, and not feeling that anymore started to, you know, signal to me that maybe I was working through it, you know, maybe the, um, some of the fog was starting to clear and I could, I could kind of feel like I I could run at something again and be confident in, you know, calls that I would make or or putting my ideas forward. I just felt like myself a little bit more again. But yeah, the the time, that eight, eight to 12 months just, you know, completely shocked me. When you think about it in, in the scheme of your life, you know, sure, a year out of, you know, out of it, when I'm looking back, I'm sure we'll feel quite minimal but at the time I thought you know a week or two a bit of a break I'll hit reset and I'll be back into it again and it just wasn't the case it took a whole lot of really deliberate practice to get to a point where I felt confident again in my own skills and I just want to make sure that people understand that this wasn't the way that you felt about outfit the entire time that you were there, you touched on earlier how when you started, I think you were in a brand and marketing consultant type capacity. And you mentioned Bruce, who's the founder. Uh, He said to you a couple of days in or thereabouts that, well, if you want to consult on this, you're going to have to get out there and sell and find us some clients. And you, you you talked about sort of being thrown into that sales role a little earlier. And you've also said a few uh, things about Bruce in the past and what it was like to work with Bruce. And I just wanted to paint that picture for people here now as well. And I'll quote you. You've said, Bruce has been my biggest advocate, mentor and friend. He took a chance on me when others wouldn't and continues to see the potential that on dimmer days I struggle to see. He is always right by my side. Now, I'm not sure where to go from here because I've only heard the story of what you've just told there around the burnout. And I've, I've heard you say things in the past, and this is while you were still at Outfit, about what it was like working with a founder and clearly quite hard. So I'm curious to understand like where, if any, there is a disconnect between 
what I've just uh, quoted you saying about uh, what it was like working with Bruce and then what ended up being the eventual outcome of your time mm-hmm. at Outfit? It's a good question, B, because I think a lot of the time when you hear about these stories, especially if it's, you know, a really significant, you know, first role or um, professional relationship, you want to hear that it's smooth sailing, right? That basically, you know, Bruce is my biggest advocate and still is today. And I would say he absolutely is, but just like I think any relationship, whether it's, you know, romantic or professional or, you know, a a friendship, you go through seasons and as people, you go through changes. And this really taught me the value of radical candor and being able to speak up and speak authentically about you know, your own opinion or, or where you may not disagree, uh, where you may not agree with someone, even if you deeply respect them. And I think I've come to understand that that is one of the more respectful, you know, and, and deeply positive things you can do for any relationship. And that is to speak up and speak honestly, but have those conversations with care. And I think through that process, I prioritized, you know, not just Bruce, but the entire company over some of my own morals and, you know, my beliefs in terms of uh, software and, you know, those important, I think, things that have become very foundational to the principles that I've you know, being developing over the years as a leader, there are really significant events that that produce those. And my, you know, relationship with Bruce and eventually parting of ways at Outfit was one of those, you know, I guess it was sort of the catalyst for me to start to think about that a lot. It's really lovely because Bruce and I text quite regularly. We still have beers quite regularly as well. Well, I normally have a red wine and, and he'll normally have a beer depending on how many we have. But we're absolutely, I think, the same people today that we were, you know, when we were excited about what Outfit could be. I think what's formed a deeper connection today is going through that that really kind of rough, deep period of disagreement and misalignment and giving each other space to grieve over that as well. I think a lot of people really separate who they are personally, you know, to who they are at work. And though there may be connection between personal values and, and you know, work values, I think some some people feel they are very separate things and I just don't see that to be true. And that process really helped me bring a lot of those personal values, things that I just would never tolerate in a, in a, you know, sort of personal capacity. It allowed me to try and, you know, bring those over into my professional life and work out how they could serve me there as well. And part of that, I think, is, is honesty and speaking up for what's right and what I genuinely believe in, but also, you know, being able to, to be flexible and um, listen to another person's point of view as well. And that process taught me a lot about, about that, I think. And luckily Bruce is a very loving, open, kind person. And I'd like to think, you know, that I'm similar on, on a good day. And so I think that's given us both the ability to kind of come back together and and connect and give each other the time and space that we needed to process. And then ultimately not throw a really incredible relationship away over you know, a a pretty small event really in the scheme of things that, you know, we got through in the end. Mm. I was sort of following this thread along of speaking up, but sort of finding your voice and not being what I got the sense of there is not being afraid to do that and also not to put everyone else ahead of your own needs. So I want to touch on something now that might raise a few eyebrows and it's to do with burnout culture more widely and something that you've said previously about this and that was we're focusing on people who grind at the computer till midnight and that type of thing and so you see everyone around you doing it and you think this is what I have to do I have to show up like this and so people just do it who aren't brave enough to have a conversation with a superior or a manager. 
So why I said that might raise a few eyebrows is from that quote, and I know it's just an isolated quote, so feel free to correct me here or paint Mm. a different picture. It sounded like you felt it was the individual's responsibility uh, to take to take responsibility for that kind of a situation to avoid getting in that in that in that sort of burnout rut. Yes, absolutely, and it probably goes back a little bit to you know the ethos on the bike, right? Is that ultimately it's it's your responsibility. I don't think that it should end, you know, with 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 you either. I think if you invite other people into that conversation, then you know, that should kick off some introspection, you know, for those involved as well. And whether that's, you know, if you're at a large company, maybe there's a a few people that can get involved at that point. If it's a a little startup, it could just be voicing to a couple of key people and making sure that you're not, I think, perpetuating that attitude. But I do think that it starts with the individual first. You, you know, it's like they say, it's, it's that, tried and and true phrase of put your own oxygen mask on first you know it it is a little bit of that self-care and knowing when to put your hand up and knowing that if you're putting your hand up you're you're going to have to allow people to help as well it also means that people may not help and may not listen and so you've really got to be prepared to take the next step if you know that signal kind of didn't I guess, elicit the outcome that you want as well. But I think it is on the individual first because everyone has a range of different tolerances and especially founders. And this is probably the the real part of it is that most founders, and I'm generalizing, right, but I think it's fair to say most founders have the propensity to push themselves much harder for much longer than a lot, you know, a lot of other people around them, hence why they're in that founding seat in the first place. And so sometimes people, you know, have their blinkers on and and they kind of get wrapped up in their own things and you've got to say, hey, I need help or this isn't right or I'm not comfortable with this. But also saying it in a way that it can be heard is really important and I think for a lot of the conversations at Outfit, especially between Bruce and I, I would have to take a lot of responsibility for how I started that conversation as well. And that, you know, doing that differently today, I think would net a different result as well. So there's, I think, a few things that you need to unpack when you when you think about whose responsibility it is and, and where it goes from there. But if it starts with you, at least you know you've done what's required and and ultimately then you, you know, you have control of sort of the next step and making that decision if it's not going the way that you want it to. This is clearly something that you've reflected on and thought a lot about. What is it that you feel you could put your finger on that stopped you from putting your oxygen mask on first? I think it was a sense of responsibility to the team first as a leader. and to a lot of people around me that that were you know going to be affected you know positively or negatively depending on the way we went and software you know in the in the scheme of things we're not saving lives some software does and that's incredible but the majority of it doesn't and and you know so i think there's a lot of seriousness that can come that is unwarranted in those situations and it can feel like life or death and you get wrapped up in that, but ultimately it's not really. And I think it's being able to take a step back and, you know, having the ability to reflect. That's something that I think I've really deeply learned from that. And I think to your question B, why why I couldn't put my hand up, I think it was a sense of, you know, responsibility and being part of a team and not wanting to let it, let the team down. and obviously, you know, again, sports analogies, but, you know, being part of the team and putting in for the team is always a, especially at a competitive level, it's something that's absolutely, you know, just part of the the fabric of any, you know, team and vocabulary and, and promise. And so for me, it was, I've got to do this. I've got to put the team first. And sometimes that meant, you know, even putting outfit and the outfit brand above you know, my wife and friends and family. 
you just mentioned putting outfit ahead of your wife, your family, and your friends. This is something that perhaps I'm drawing a line that doesn't exist between these two points, but you've previously said that product is hard and that's because you have to get comfortable with saying no to people. How much of that demand that in a startup that you were facing as a head of product from, I think you mentioned there, you were kind of sort of suggesting that you were you felt responsible uh, for the team ahead of yourself. How much of that pressure not to say no do you feel had a role in just where you ended up at the end there with Outfit? Oh, I think it was the primary role, absolutely, especially when, you know, you aren't quite sure on the vision or the direction or, you know, the the long term versus the short term. And I think every startup goes through this and, you know, they a lot of the time you'll you'll hear in early phases, you know, not quite having product market fit and chasing it and, you know, sort of appeasing customers to to get to a certain point where you can start making your own choices. But I think it is just a constant negotiation and there's never a, an end point where you have fit, things continue to evolve and you should be sort of checking in. And, and so I think perhaps where the the disconnect was there is that where I felt I was putting the right things ahead of others, I just wasn't and not checking back in and, you know, kind of, I guess, slowing down to speed up, especially in a strategic capacity, you know, that just, I kind of got swept up in what we needed to do to continue to grow um, at all costs, essentially, and and costs to, you know, both the, the strategy, the direction of the company, but also myself personally, I think. Yeah, you're touching on the pace there, the pace of tech that we can experience. And you've been working in a very high paced part of tech as well, right? And startups and the it's, yeah, it can be very, very, very hard on the people that work there, particularly if they don't put in place the checks and balances, like you were saying about, you know, slowing down to speed up if that doesn't come naturally. And I understand while you're at Outfit, you've previously said something about, celebrating wins that really okay. stuck with me and it was it's such a well hopefully the people listening to this they can get a sense of of what I mean by this and I'll quote you now you said we won quite a large client and we delayed the celebration and I think there was a big learning for us at, of not doing that sometimes you have to go all right what are we going to do and actually put the time aside celebrate it as a team and then move on What was the impact on the team of not celebrating, not taking the time to celebrate that win? I think that I've subconsciously drawn a quite a decent, I guess, connection to those types of celebrations and and myself as a kid. So one thing that I haven't really touched on a a whole lot is that although mum and I had an incredible relationship, she was also as a an individual a, an extremely intelligent high achiever where she where she applied herself so there are a lot of things that were effortless for mum and i think as she observed me growing up she sort of carried through a lot of you know her own childhood experience which was they you know mum's family didn't often celebrate a whole lot because the kids were especially in a sporting capacity, they were all so gifted. And I remember coming home, you know, from my first few sports days and I remember kind of having this fist full of ribbons. I I think I had a couple of blue ones in there and mostly red. So blue being first and red being second. And mum, you know, sort of looked at me and went, that's great. And that was sort of the the long and the short of it. And I think it's also because mum had an extreme belief in me that she had a feeling that whatever I put my mind to, I would achieve, but that almost became the norm. And not that I was incredible at at everything at school. There was certainly a lot of things that that I really struggled with, but where I think she could see that I um, put my mind to something, you know, the outcome was, was almost expected that I would succeed. And upon reflection, I think that 
that really shaped my view of my achievements and, you know, not kind of stopping and acknowledging what was good and, and, you know, just sort of, I, I always felt like we were sort of on to the next thing. And I think that if you apply it to startups can be a very, very common pattern. I think more often than not, it's because in the, you know, at the early stages, you're really looking for the next win that you need to get to the next win. And so before you know it, you've, you miss the celebration completely because you've had the celebration or, or you've, you've sort of seen the path ahead of the, you know, the win. And so you don't stop and think about what it took to get there. You're thinking about the next part of the path that it opens up. And so when you do that, consistently on repeat to a team I think you undermine the effort and they start to believe that that is that's the norm that's the standard we you know achieve quite highly all the time and it's nothing to be celebrated and that's just completely and utterly soul crushing and culture destroying because you have to celebrate the wins even if it's the little things you could have you know quite a quite a bad day, but maybe it's just one or two little wins that are going to allow you to get up and and do it again the next day. And so I think you've really got to take the time, good and bad, whether the win is you know a massive one like we experienced at Outfit, or or whether it's just something small that you've seen you know someone in the team deliver well, or you know it doesn't even have to be work related, right? You've really got to celebrate wins in life because I think you miss out on sort of the, the, the beauty of the process and, and the journey. And yeah, you, you kind of, you kind of forget to reflect and take stock and pause and understand how much effort, you know, that it took and, and that it is something worth celebrating. Ash, it sounds like this has been such a pivotal past few years for you on this particular topic. What have you changed as a result of previously not stopping to celebrate these wins with the team, like what specific things are you doing differently now as a result of this realisation? I certainly can still get better at this, I think. There's always <laughs> always room to, to do better and it's really, it's actually quite touching for you to have dug through so many of my interviews and things, Brendan. Honestly, I've never had someone bring, you know, so many things to light. So this has been incredible in itself to just remind myself of why that's important. But one thing that's a big theme for me at the moment in life to get things done because, you know, life is is busy and there's so much going on. Yes, massive celebrations are, are excellent and putting the time in and and actually putting time aside and, you know, making sure that the team is aware that, you know, we're going to go and do something or take time out or whatever it is, you know, that's something that's changed. But I think for me on the smaller day-to-day side of things, it's if I see something that's amazing, not waiting until I see that person next, you know, sending a Slack message or, you know, making time to go and speak to that person at that moment or calling things out in a group setting, you know, where you can. I think just constantly being a bit of a a role model of of how you can do that and it doesn't have to be a huge celebration. It can be something small, but if you can be a little bit deliberate about your words or how you frame it or, you know, whatever it is, I think just taking time to embed smaller celebrations like that in the day over you know whatever type of win you want kind of leads to people understanding that, standing that celebrating is important and it gives you time to reflect and, and kind of building things that are a little bit ritualistic around that as well so at Askable and, and this is this little ritual existed before I started anytime we hit a, a sales goal or a usage goal or you know whatever type of goal that we've set and it's pretty common at Askable to hit goals we always crack a bottle of champagne and you know if we hit that sales goal at you know, 10 a.m., then we're all having a glass at that point and everything stops and we all get together as a team and acknowledge that win. And I think it's a little bit of that immediacy as well that I'm getting at is, 
hey, we've hit it. It's happened. Like we're not delaying it, you know, like like I sort of, like the example you gave, we're doing it now and it's happening or we're not sort of, it's not going to go on too long in the future. We're, we're going to celebrate it pretty soon. I think that's kind of part of the euphoria that you have when, when you win. Kind of want to be in that moment with everyone and celebrate in that moment. So yeah, I think part of part of it is working out your rituals, working out your triggers and knowing that everyone is aligned and can celebrate together. Ash, something that I really wanted to leave enough time in our conversation to go into is something that you've perhaps not in the immediate sense that we were talking about here in terms of celebrating wins, but definitely recently you've shared something that you learned about yourself, which was that you have been diagnosed with ADHD. And it's not something specifically the ADHD, although I am really interested to discuss that if we have time, but it's it's that's one part of what makes you someone who is different to most people. You're someone who's also openly queer and you've previously shared your experience about what it was like for you coming out when you were 13. And I also noticed in recent years, and people may have picked this up from your introduction, that you've started using they, them pronouns as well. I want to come back to what this was like in your earlier years because, and I'll summarize um, what you've said previously about this here. It's that you you felt like you lacked the language to articulate your identity. And then you went on to contrast what this is like for your stepkids and who are growing up with a much deeper understanding of gender, identity, and sexuality. So what I'm curious about is do you ever wonder what it would be like if you and your peers had that same level of comfort and awareness when you were growing up? All the time, all the time. I wonder about it all the time. I wonder just about small things like, you know, restrooms. Like for the majority of, of my life, you know, there's there's been generally when you go to a shopping center or, you know, airport, whatever, there's three, right? There's the parents' room and there's the men's and there's the women's. And even that very small, I guess, choice in life, you know, it was just there. And I, I never thought that it could be different. There was never another option, really. And I, yeah, I reflect on this all the time, B. I, I, I'm not really sure how different I would be as a person in, in the sense that I'm sure that it would have had a huge impact. It's wild to think about what that, you know, would have meant for me. And it's actually at times, I think, a little bit frightening because you, you know, you sort of have such a deep sense of identity by the time you get to this age and you've kind of, you know, your identity is being formed on a few of those, you know, hardships, I suppose. And I wonder, would I be as sort of resilient or as gritty or focused if, you know, I didn't have, I guess, those challenges early on or if I didn't have that tension or pushback, you know, from the vast majority of people. I don't want to glorify suffering that way. Like, I don't think that's what I'm trying to get at. But I do think that there's there's moments in life that, that kind of shape you. And I think a lot have been around, you know, my gender and sexuality. I was always well supported by my close group of friends. And you know, teachers and adults, I think, who just could see who I was going to grow up, you know, to be. And they kept me safe and, and they supported me quite deeply. But I think I would probably have a little bit, you know, less trauma if everyone was a little bit more aligned in terms of just, you know, using the right words for for the right people. Now, speaking about uh, trauma, you've previously said, and I'll quote you now, I was quite ashamed for many, many years when I started getting into the workforce. My identity was something that I certainly kept at home. What or were there specific moments or incidents that reinforced that feeling that you should keep your identity, in inverted commas, at home? Absolutely. There was a, you know, I, I very, very distinctly recall a, a job interview that I went through where we got to the end and I was successful. And the the guy interviewing me at the time said, oh, if you wouldn't mind, Ash, I know you've mentioned your partner a few times, but, 
you know, our, um, our boss here is, is quite staunchly opposed to, you know, the, the gay agenda. And at the time there was a lot of momentum building in Australia around marriage equality. And, and we were coming up to the, you know, the, the plebiscite date was, was close to being set. So we were still a while off, but you know, there was a lot out in the press and I obliged. I said, sure, I understand. But that was a, that was a big moment for me. And I've had, you know, other moments where I've, I've been in more corporate jobs and the attire that I've been asked to wear is, you know, completely at the other end of the spectrum from what I, I normally would wear, you know, told to cover tattoos up and, you know, things like that. So that, you know, that those two are, are quite significant for me, I think, because it was literally, hey, keep your sexuality at home and, you know, dress differently. Obviously, uh, there's uniforms and things at, at many places, but even at the time, there wasn't the range or even the, I think the gender expression in, you know, corporate wear that there is today. Like you look at places like Woolworths. I was at a a conference a while back and one of the speakers was sort of talking deeply about um, a project that they did where they got to design the, you know, sort of the corporate wardrobe for Woolworths. And, you know, they were talking about every individual under the sun being represented in that from, you know, important sort of, I guess, religious beliefs right through to, you know, gender identity and being able to choose and express yourself in any way. And I just, it's such a, such an extreme change in such a a small amount of time, which is incredible, but you know, I'm, I'm certainly not that old and I've sort of, I've seen the, the gamut of that. And I know that there's, there are those who have come before me who, who have had it much, much harder and far more restrictive. But for me, those are a couple of key events that sort of really stood out early that I was a bit shocked by even at that point in time. And so from where you are now and thinking about those experiences, how do you feel they impacted you? How did they affect you? It's made me quite upfront now when it comes to Everything from who I associate with through to, you know, how I look at any opportunity in in front of me. It's also made me embrace difference of opinion and not shy away from those conversations. And it's really important for me to take the time to understand, you know, the individual and where they're coming from. Because I think a lot of the time, these types of decisions or opinions come from really deep core beliefs. And, you know, a lot of the time those are formed quite early in life. And I think sometimes you you would talk to an individual and they might not even really know why they believe something. They just know they do or it's or it's something that's been reinforced through family or or, you know, whatever. And so for me, it's about being clear on my boundaries and and what I need, you know, and what I believe is right for people and and creating safe environments and being able to show up. But then also kind of, you know, being a, a little bit, I guess, challenging and trying to understand why certain people feel a certain way or have a certain belief. And if you're able to move them even just a little bit, you know, closer to a, a slightly different view, I think it's a worthwhile thing doing. I think you've you've got to know the type of person who is in front of you and how that may play out. But, you know, I think you get older and you kind of know how to make those calls when you meet someone as well. But yeah, I, I think it's given me a really clear sense of what I need, you know, what's challenging at work if, if you know, so something's framed a certain way and what's not. And then it's given me the confidence to challenge other people a little bit more openly on, you know, a range of different things, it's not just about, you know, gender and, and diversity of thought and, you know, all of those sort of very important topics. But there's, there's things wider than that that serve me today. I think when, I, when we're talking about product and people have difference of opinion and things like that, I think not fearing that healthy debate and knowing that you can separate the person from the idea and having those conversations around an idea rather than at a person can kind of be quite surprising because you can walk out of there with that person also saying, 
I, I've, I'm thinking about this differently now as well. This is reminding me of a quote that I'd written down from something completely or potentially completely different that you'd said previously, and I'll just read this to you and see if it resonates with where we're at in this part of the conversation. You said, I really try to understand the way that the traffic flows and then you know where you can change lanes, where you can be a little bit more boisterous on the bike and where you just need to sit in your lane. Yes. So I recall uh, that was obviously, a, a you know, we were talking about road craft and things like that. It's, this, it's, you know, these things kind of cut through for a reason, right? Like how you have conversations with people about what and when, you know, all of those things are, are variables. I think that you're constantly kind of traversing and negotiating with in life. And it's the, you know, picking your battles and, and your approach. I think those things absolutely overlap. And one thing I've been exploring quite deeply in, you know, over the last few months, feeling like I'm in a, a, a really kind of clear headspace is putting my principles down. And like I said before, you know, going through that process, I've realized personal principles, work principles, they're all the same. And so I think there's, there's these underlying kind of ways of thinking that will serve you well. And yeah, whether it's on the bike, whether it's you know, with a partner or whether it's a work conversation, like knowing how that person is showing up that day, you know, and, and knowing how to have that conversation is, you know, sort of part of the battle, I think, and whether they're going to be receptive to it or whether it's best to leave it completely or or maybe come back at another time. And at work, you seem to have been able to literally realize or express these values or principles that you hold. Now, Askable is a company that's put a lot of visible emphasis on diversity and specifically in the way that it helps researchers to find people from diverse backgrounds to do research with. And about this, you've previously said, and I'll quote you again, a part of me is thankful we are having those conversations as a product team where I can see that my pronouns are in our simple screener questions and that just completely blows my mind. So what stories, if any, have you heard from customers about these types of features in the product or perhaps its participants? It's interesting because we have lots of conversations around this both, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say bad, but from lots of different perspectives. And I think one thing that we are trying to find the line around or, or tread carefully is a lot of people do want to show up and, and kind of represent, you know, maybe their personal intersectionality on, on a few of these topics. And some people don't. And I think being sensitive to that is really important as well. We, I think we assume that if someone is a certain way that they'll, they'll be quite open and wanting to, you know, talk about that. And some people don't. And so that's been, you know, part of the challenge of, I guess, working out how we allow our participants in the app to, you know, sort of divulge this information if they want to, but also help them understand that it's it's completely fine if if they don't. And that's obviously with a with probably more subtle sort of nuanced, you know, whether it's demographics or or attitudes. But there is a broader sense that, you know, diversity of thought background, you know, race, gender, all of those things, having that makes for better research. And most clients, if not, you know, all understand that at least at a basic level now and building it into the product and and having it just as part of the DNA of how we think and, and how we build features has meant we just naturally start to take all different you know, types of people into consideration, not, and, and also not just around sort of demographic stuff, but accessibility and making sure that's type of mind as well. So I think it just has this really beautiful impact on everything, whether it's, you know, who we're putting in illustrations or how we're thinking about features and, and who we believe, you know, the audience is um, primarily. It's a, it's a tricky one. I think you're always trying to be, Um, deliberate about who you're designing for but you know there's also the reality that you're you're never quite across every need or or you know every background so I think just keeping our team curious and making sure that they understand they don't 
know of everything and you know they're they're still learning as well having that as just part of the journey and always trying to be um respectful open curious like it's just I think it's really built in some nice kind of logic and and muscle when the team's thinking about solving problems and you know make some pretty good people as well and I don't want to underweight the impact that these changes are having you know, the significance of them but from my my way of looking at these these aren't large changes right they're significant but they're small like the, the, this is a culture of being more accommodating to more people showing up in things like making sure that drop downs have you know pronouns that are inclusive for a wider group of people so we're not asking people to complete you're not asking people to completely re-engineer product here but these series of small yet significant changes that are being built into the product over time what impact if any do you feel that they're having on the trajectory or the broader conversation that's going on in society at the moment around gender and diversity i think it's making the people who have you know, historically been uncomfortable, more uncomfortable, which is great because that, you know, when you feel that stretch, I think that's when you know you're kind of in the right zone and maybe you're being exposed to something that is important. But you're right, B, this isn't groundbreaking stuff, you know, and but nor is having a unisex restroom in a, you know, in a location. And we see just the sheer, you know, range of that in our daily lives. And although those things seem small, they still delightful for me when I, I find them. They're still, you know, they they give me that feeling in any product, you know, and whether that's a massive brand that has the people power to invest in research and and, you know, really kind of thoroughly think through who their audience is right through to, you know, smaller companies like us who are just quite passionate about it and trying to be deliberate around how we're considering it. I think just through exposure, you know, people are thinking about where there's gaps, you know, in their lives, in their language, their, you know, if they are in product, their products, things like that. I think it's just, it's just bringing a, a different type of awareness to many different places and areas because of the what we're including now versus what what was excluded in the past how do you feel about those people that might use the product and this is something that you've invested a lot of energy into right and this is something that's quite personal i would imagine you were talking there earlier on about how the separation between personal life and work life isn't really something that you see how do you feel about those people that might be using askable and feeling uncomfortable about the level of inclusion that's present in the product? I would hope that, well, firstly, I, w I would hope that they are, you know, seeking, I guess, that support or help that they need and that if it was, you know, truly that difficult that they were able to have a conversation with, you know, myself or anyone in the team. But I also think that the stretch is fair. And, you know, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing, but I would assume that people who are feeling uncomfortable about those things have probably had a level of comfort in their life in the majority of situations where, you know, the minorities haven't as well. And so I think if people feeling uncomfortable can, can take that sort of learner mindset and, and kind of self-reflect and understand why they feel uncomfortable and, and what's triggering that. I'm really hoping it has a, a bit of a deeper impact and perhaps they might start to reconsider how they're making decisions. Whether they change their mind or not is neither here nor there. I think just having people start to reflect and think about their thinking is is probably the most important part, I think, for all of us, whether we think we're on the right side of this or not. You know, understanding why you're there and maybe how you form that opinion is almost more important than the opinion itself. Well, Ash, as we bring our conversation down to a close now and thinking about the, the people that you're trying to include that are on the other side of this particular conversation, I'm mindful that there may be some listeners out there that are grappling with similar feelings of shame about their identity and in particular in the relation to their professional lives, much like you experienced in the past. 
what advice or words of encouragement or thoughts would you like to offer them? Probably the if I could leave them with one thing, it's to make sure that they've got safe space. And this cuts both ways, right? And, and I'm not saying people who are uncomfortable with, with pronouns, you know, should be sheltered for too much longer, but it's still a journey and it's a journey for everyone. And I think it's really, you know, it goes back to burnout. It goes back to all of those things. You have to create space to look after yourself. And so if, you know, you're in a job where the reality is, is you just can't show up the way that you want to, I really hope those people have, you know, some type of community that's close to the one that they, you know, would hope to be open in. And that may help them work out how do I navigate this? Where, where is safe near this? Or, you know, is there a way that I can sort of have a, an inclusive environment in the future? I think sometimes when you're focusing on what's in front of you, it, it can be very all or nothing thinking. And I, I remember, you know, being in those positions and thinking, this is just how every job is. This is how the world is. If I want to be successful as a designer, then this is how I'm going to have to show up, which is wild because it's, you know, design, uh, another tangent. But I think if you can take the time and, and be deliberate about creating that space and make, making sure you protect that, that will give you the energy to get up again and have some of the more tougher conversations or, compromise, you know, where you need to for the right reasons, you know, for your future as well. But I think, again, like we were talking about, you know, thinking about your thinking and, and making sure you're reflecting on that, you've really got to check in with yourself and, and work out, you know, when is enough enough as well. And sometimes you have to make those hard calls. So I think if you can have, you know, a supportive environment that's not a crazy echo chamber and is, you know, you're, you're keeping fairly level-headed and making good trade-offs, that will put you in good stead to deal with any type of situation, right? Whether it's, you know, because you belong to, to a, a smaller community that identify in a certain way or if you're just dealing with someone difficult at work. Like I think all of these things, you know, kind of can transcend you know, the, the kind of context and using that approach of getting your energy, understanding what you can control, you know, feeling loved and valued, and then using that as a way to, to go and fight the good fight. I think that's the, the thing that's potentially a, an, an endless cycle of, you know, possibility. And what an important point to finish on. Ash, you've been so candid and courageous in this conversation. Thank you for so generously sharing your stories and your insights with me today. Brennan, thank you for being honestly so, so considered and, and careful. And you've told such a beautiful story on my behalf as well. So um, thank you so much. I, I deeply appreciate it. Oh, you're most welcome, Ash. You're most welcome. Ash, if people want to find out more about you and follow all the wonderful things that you've been contributing to the product and design communities, what's the best way for them to do that? Look, I, I love a good LinkedIn request because then we can work out what channel's best. So if in doubt, hit me up on LinkedIn and, and we'll find our space together. Okay, great. Thanks, Ash. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. Everything we've covered will be in the show notes, including where you can find Ash on LinkedIn and all of the things that we've been speaking about will be chaptered. So make sure you check those out. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX research, product management and design, don't forget to leave a review. Also subscribe to the podcast so it turns up every two weeks and tell someone else, maybe just one other person that you feel would get value from these types of conversations at depth. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just search for Brendan Jarvis. There's also a link to my profile at the very bottom of the show notes, or you can head on over to my website, which is thespaceinbetween.co.nz. That's thespaceinbetween.co.nz. And until next time. Hey, 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 hey.